in this talk, uh, what I would like to cover is the um, current knowledge of cannabis in uh, neurological disorders, but especially Parkinson's disease. And uh, I would like to go over the potential risks and benefits of cannabis, therefore, in um, Parkinson's disease. And um, I'll mention about the, uh, the uh, I guess, problems, the, um, the uh, ways that, the difficulties that I've had with uh, doing research in, uh, with cannabis. Is the cannabis, I mean, is this not working? My objectives? Uh, I am um, trying to look at Parkinson's disease and the potential risks and benefits of uh, cannabis, especially THC versus CBD. Um, I'll go over some of the uh, problems or hurdles that I've had with doing research on cannabis. And I will uh, um, tell you about the current um, state of the research that I've been doing. <coughs> So, how did I get involved in this? Um, this is one of my patients. He's 55 years old. Uh, he, on the day that he turned 50, I had to tell him that he has Parkinson's disease. And um, that was particularly hard on him because he had a mother that had onset when he was 50. I mean, when she was 50, and she um, passed away within five years. So she had a particularly aggressive, bad form, and he's done quite well. Uh, in comparison, but um, he's an avid soccer player and bicyclist, and that actually was a good thing for him because exercise might slow down the progression of Parkinson's. Um, when I told him that um, he had Parkinson's, then he wanted to look and see what could he do, of course, and um, asked me about complementary and alternative methods of treating Parkinson's, and there really was no information and um, no good solid information. So uh, he went ahead and has found that if he does a um, hit of, uh, uh, if he vapes um, cannabis about 20 minutes before he gets on his bike, uh, then he has less of the dystonic in interning posturing of his foot. Um, young onset Parkinson's patients often get dystonia with exercise. And so that's what he would get. And if he had the, um, if he did the vaping, then he would not get it very much and he could have a nice workout. He did also report that he also couldn't focus very well for three or four hours. <laughs> and uh, he's an entrepreneur and um, he's on his third product, which I think is gonna work. And so he would have to time his, uh, his vaping um, with his exercise and his work. But um, um, he and my and uh, other patients with Parkinson's disease, it, this is another one here, he's at Burning Man. Um, they, uh, they really have been seeking uh, alternative treatments to the heavy duty drugs that we give them. And so many of them have been asking and trying all sorts of different stuff. I think it's important for us to um, have some scientific information. So um, Parkinson's is uh, relatively common neurodegenerative disorder affecting about 1% of people over age 50. Um, it's characterized, mostly people recognize the motor symptoms, which are rest tremor, stiffness, slowness, and um, balance difficulties. But also folks really are bothered by the non-motor symptoms. They have cognitive problems, um, anxiety, depression, uh, they have hallucinations sometimes, particularly from the medicines that we give them on top of the disease. They have a lot of sleep problems and autonomic problems. Um, so there's about a million people affected in the United States and around 15,000 here, 15, here in Colorado. So we did a survey, a um, colleague of mine, um, Benzie Kluger, did a survey of our Parkinson's population here at the University of Colorado and found that about 5% of our patients with Parkinson's were taking uh, um, cannabis. And they were taking all sorts of different varieties. And what they did report was a lot of them were taking it because they found it was helping. And they reported that it reduced tremor and stiffness and anxiety, um, sometimes helped them sleep. Uh, but also the older folks told us they didn't like the high uh, that it made them feel off balance and um, dizzy. 
So um, everybody knows about THC, um, and I'm going to phrase it, um, talk about it in terms of Parkinson's a little bit. So as you know, it's the major psychoactive component of cannabis. I don't really like the term psychoactive because um, because I think people should say it's it's the thing that causes you to get high. Um, the uh, other components of uh, of cannabis also have effects on the brain, so they're psychoactive. Um, but uh, nausea and um, vomiting, clearly, um, excellent studies have shown that um, THC reduces that. It also helps appetite and it helps pain, um, likely. And so there has been other studies that are less proven, but um, looks like it helps uh, multiple sclerosis in some ways. But it can have adverse effects too of impairing cognition and causing psychiatric symptoms. So cannabidiol, um, alternatively, does not cause the high, um, and it uh, is present to a lesser extent in cannabis, although you can get it in higher potency CBD now, of course, from the dispensaries than, um, than uh, in lower THC. Um, and it has potential beneficial medicinal uses, but it's way less studied than TH THC or cannabis with higher THC. Um, for example, it's in uh, um, experimental models, meaning uh, 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 test tubes it, and all, it looks like it acts as an anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, anti-emetic, um, etc. So it might have some very good um, benefits in terms of Parkinson's disease. Um, I, I am, in my patients with Parkinson's, they already have a neurodegenerative disorder, so you have to be careful about what you're going to give them if it's going to work through the brain. And um, for cannabis, then studies have shown that it acutely and chronically has effects on the brain. So acutely, um, then it impairs verbal learning and memory and also attention um, and psychomotor function. And then chronically, it has some of these effects also. Um, uh, recent studies have shown that, um, recent studies have suggested that um, there's structural changes in the brain, particularly in the temporal and frontal cortices in the cerebellum. And functional studies um, also have shown uh, changes in the brain. So in terms of Parkinson's, it, it would we want to give them THC or CBD? Um, THC might just exacerbate the s symptoms that they already have of problems with cognition, too much anxiety, um, a tendency to psychosis, and balance difficulties. Whereas the CBD part uh, might help with some of their symptoms, such as um, reducing their anxiety and reducing their tendency to hallucinate. So there's been actually um, a lot of studies in CBD uh, in humans, um, and uh, there's been some specifically in Parkinson's. Um, for example, there was uh, a study of um, when, when people with Parkinson's take the most common medication that they take, which is levodopa, then they often get an extra movement that we call dyskinesia. They kind of like get too much movement. And um, so there was this one study where they, it was actually a very low dose. Uh, and it was a good study, but it didn't show any benefit on, um, on those extra movements that people with Parkinson's get. And perhaps that's because it was a relatively low dose. So there's been a lot of other different studies with different amounts of combined THC and uh, different, way different doses. Um, and uh, so the, the, com the amount of THC and the compositions are, uh, have varied widely, but if you just look at CBD, then studies suggest that people can take orally up to 1,500 milligrams a day, and it's pretty well tolerated. So, so to pause for a moment on, um, on uh, research and what the conclusions that you can make from it. So um, case reports are, are what we commonly do. We notice an effect and we report that we see that effect in five people that we didn't expect to see. So we report that and that's a case report.
but it's really anecdotal. Um, and so then you can try to match those cases. Uh, and so that's a case control study. You can do cohort studies where you follow a group of people over time. And um, then really the gold standard is randomized controlled trials. And that's um, uh, where you can draw more conclusive results. And the best evidence, the most solid evidence, is when you actually have several randomized controlled trials and you um, do a meta-analysis of that. And then you can really decide whether something is working or not working. The state of the art or of science in cannabis is way down still in, the, in terms of case reports and cohort studies at best. There have been some randomized controlled trials, but especially in the area that I'm looking at, um, there's not anything definitive. So um, I think Dr. Delaval said it eloquently, um, the restrictions that are placed on researchers. Uh, I'm a, a, um, not an employee of the VA, uh, but I uh, am a university professor, and, and, I, and actually researchers in the United States, whether you're a university professor or not, um, there's two ways of doing cannabis research. One is to give the patient cannabis, um, and the other is to do observational research. Just, they're already taking cannabis, and you observe what they're doing and measure things that have to do with that. Um, so so uh, to get some funding, um, then the state of Colorado had uh, restrictions too, and, um, and as a result, uh, the type of research that I could do would mean that I would need to get the, um, the uh, cannabis from a source that, was, I, that the FDA would approve of and that, that the DEA would also allow me to, to um, pursue. And so that means that I had to get it from uh, the National Institutes of Drug Abuse. And so um, they, have, they contract presently with the University of Mississippi and have for many years. And they um, have been working on trying to produce a high CBD to THC um, uh, study product and have recently uh, told me that they have had a 30 to 1. Um, but uh, at the time that I was starting this research, the best that they had was like a 10 to 1. And so it really wasn't an option because uh, I didn't want my Parkinson's patients to get too much THC. Um, so I was not sure if I, I wasn't going to be able to use the NIDA source. And, um, I'll continue that story in a moment, but what I wanted to study was the CBD and see if it had an effect in Parkinson's disease and specifically on tremor. So um, my primary uh, um, specific aim though was to see if it was tolerated, if it was safe, because just the level of uh, research I was doing it hadn't been done before, so that's the first thing you check. And secondarily, I had um, designed outcome measures to look at tremor and to look at other aspects of Parkinson's. So um, this is the different ways that I was studying those outcomes. And um, specifically in terms of Parkinson's disease and tremor, we have a um, <coughs> widely accepted standardized rating scale that we use. So we um, apply the rating scale in clinic. Um, we can measure a person's tremor, for example, um, it, for zero is that they have no tremor, one is that it's slight and it's um, a certain amplitude, it's uh, small, and four is it's very large. And, um, and then also we can uh, measure how constant is it. Uh, four is 100% and one is um, uh, 10 to 25% of, or less than 25% of the time that they're in clinic with you. Um, so we have rating scales and it's called the United Parkinson's, uh, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. Um, and that's what I chose to use to, uh, to uh, study tremor, but also um, it, that United Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale um, looks at all different aspects of Parkinson's. And um, so we um, use that scale and every other scale practically that, I could, that we, we could, we wanted to look at all different aspects of Parkinson's since we had the opportunity and since they had so many different symptoms. And so we uh, um, checked them for, uh, did assessment tools on all these different areas. Um, so they had to meet, the only criteria that they had to meet to participate in the study was that they had to have a decent tremor. 
uh, and, um, and not a history of drug or alcohol dependence. And we've had some very excellent discussion of the importance of um, tolerance. Uh, and so we decided that we would uh, have patients stop the um, stop or be non-users, but but at least have to have a negative testing um, when they came in and got started. Um, so the, the protocol involved two stages. Uh, first off, we wanted to um, figure out what dose uh, to use and, um, and get an idea of safety and a signal for efficacy. And then we would apply that to a randomized controlled study. So first we had an open label dose escalation study and they had a, um, a, a uh, screening visit, then a baseline visit. And then we put them on a low dose and we titrated them up, uh, calling them every three days as they titrated up. And then they came in at their highest dose visit and we um, evaluated them. And then they came back um, late, a few weeks later as a safety follow-up visit. So that was the protocol for the um, open label study. So the big issue was what can I use if I want to do a study? Uh, the CDPHE gave me funding and I agreed to use a NIDA product, but then actually I got the funding and I found out I, that I didn't, really didn't want to use what they had available in Parkinson's patients. And so um, it took me a while, but I ended up uh, um, negotiating and, uh, and working um, with uh, GW Pharmaceuticals that are now Greenwich Biosciences in the um, U.S. branch here uh, to use their product which is called Epidiolex and it is 98% pure CBD and has less than 0.15% THC and it's suspended in sesame oil to 100 milligrams per milliliter. They are using this product to study pediatric epilepsy, very severe forms, and um, are looking for an orphan uh, designation from the FDA, uh, and they have just submitted uh, to the FDA after doing some extensive uh, studies and have found that it was very effective. And so um, they're hopeful that they will get that indication within the next year. But in the meantime, they let me use it for um, my Parkinson's study. So uh, just to pause for a moment on um, what it took to get started, uh, they, there was lots of different steps. First, the University of Colorado, the university setting has its uh, rules, but the University of Colorado was very supportive um, of this research. The University of Colorado Hospital um, would not allow for uh, cannabis to be on the premises for me to do the research there. And so the CTRC, Clinical Research uh, Trial Center, was um, uh, available to me. And they, the University of Colorado actually built a room um, to, uh, uh, to store, um, according to DEA regulations and all. And they built another room um, for one of my uh, colleagues uh, to, uh, uh, to do specific um, vaping type uh, um, research. So they were very supportive. Um, with any study, uh, if I was to uh, want to do a study then um, in the CTRC, then they have a scientific advisory review committee um, as part of their <coughs> obligations to the National Institutes of Health, and so I have to go through that. And they actually helped me refine my protocol and were very helpful. Um, long, painful process, though. And uh, then the uh, IRB, Human Subjects Committee, um, was after that. And after I got that approval, um, when we had a lot of discussions about driving and a lot of different um, issues, then we went, I had to get an IND, an investigational new, dr new drug uh, approval from the FDA to use the Epidiolex in this way. And that wasn't too hard. That actually only took me um, uh, about a month. And I had to get um, a DEA Schedule One license. As a physician, you have a Schedule Two through Five license but um, marijuana falls under Schedule 1, and um, that involved a local DEA inspection. It, it took about two months. It wasn't, wasn't too bad. Um, and then the university has uh, a lot of other, um, other things, too, that you have to take care of, but that's really for all different research. 
Um, but between all of that, all of that, then there's a lot of paperwork that I have to maintain um, for the FDA and for everybody, and keep doing uh, renewals and updates. So it's a lot of work, and it took me 22 months to get started on the first patient after I was told that I was funded, and um, but I didn't get any money until uh, until I had all of all of the fun everything in place. So this is why you do it. <laughs> um, so we um, started on the uh, open label, and uh, we completed it. Um, we had 15 patients enrolled. Uh, one withdrew consent. One was a screen failure, um, and so we had 13 left. Um, so then uh, we had uh, three people in the process of the study drop out. One because he got a rash. So I thought that. Um, the urticaria, he, he, this was a fellow that worked in a plant store um, uh, for a long time and he had, uh, he would get um, rashes from a certain type of plant and he said it would uh, cross-react it, he thought, with this plant, with this, this was actually an extract from a plant, but that's what, probably what he, the lowest dose he got, uh, severe um, urticaria. So he dropped out and then two other patients uh, dropped out. One had a lot of GI um, problems at her baseline that had been very stable for about a year, but they flared up when we gave, started giving her a bunch of oil. Um, at the high doses, then people were taking like 10 milliliters of oil twice a day. Um, and um, then another patient had some uh, symptomatic liver problems and dropped out. So we ended up having 10 people that we could do an efficacy analysis on, but we looked at everybody um, that took study drug to, look, to study safety. So um, the patients were on average 68 years old, um, mostly men, and they, um, they had mi mild to um, early middle stage Parkinson's disease, and they'd had it for about six years. They were, um, they were doing overall, they, were, uh, they had normal cognition, they were all ambulatory, um, they were doing pretty well in general. So adverse events was our primary outcome. And um, while it looks like there's a lot of them here and there's a high percentage, they were mild. And um, um, so uh, diarrhea, I think, was probably related to the oil uh, con amount that they were taking. Um, and somnolence uh, was probably related to the relatively high doses that they would get to. Um, fatigue, uh, along with the somnolence, and then we had um, smaller amounts of other side effects and a uh, small amount of a lot of different side effects. So again, they were mostly mild. Uh, three patients out of the 13 dropped out, so that was about 20% due to intolerance. And that's about average for clinical studies. Um, no serious adverse events. So 38% of our patients had elevated liver functions um, that on blood testing and uh, for all studies then that's something that you always look at really closely because um, because people will often have um, elevated liver function um, but is it clinically relevant or not and uh, so um, four out of the five patients had a pattern where their um, it wasn't the uh, hardcore liver that was affected, it was the biliary cells um, that were more affected. And we could tell that in the pattern of the liver enzyme elevations. And that's unusual. Usually in drug uh, studies, then it is the um, liver cells that are affected. Um, we only tested the liver enzymes at the highest dose. And that's the dose that we picked because that's the dose that worked in pediatric epilepsy. Um, so we don't know if the liver function changes started at a lower dose or not, but out of uh, these five patients, only one was symptomatic. And they, all of them, their liver function blood tests went back to normal by, um, in follow-up. Um, the one patient that was symptomatic had an ultrasound, and it was negative, and he was doing, he did very well. He's enrolled in another study now and doing, doing well. Um, on an open label study, you cannot say anything solid about efficacy. 
Um, but we did uh, study um, the patients at baseline and then study them again uh, at the highest dose. And according to our testing, then the patients did not have any improvement in their tremor, according to our testing. And um, they did have improvement overall, though, in their motor signs and overall in their Parkinson's, according to this unified Parkinson's disease rating scale that we use. They um, also reported some benefit. Uh, they also had, according to our testing, uh, some benefits in nighttime sleepiness. And um, that means they slept better at night and um, they were less irritable and um, had improvement in this emotional behavioral discontrol test. Uh, you know, although they, I showed you the adverse uh, events slide with a lot of somnolence and fatigue and all that, that didn't show up in our assessments when we were actually assessing for somnolence, um, a change in that from the beginning to the end. Um, so in conclusion, um, using Epidiolex uh, at the doses that are effective in pediatric epilepsy, um, there were mild adverse effects, uh, particularly somnolence, diarrhea, and fatigue, and that there were some um, hints at efficacy. Um, so it might be beneficial in Parkinson's. But uh, um, what our story goes on, that we want to go on to do a randomized controlled uh, trial now, but because of the elevated liver function, uh, testing um, that came up in this trial, then GW decided uh, to not supply the drug for the randomized control portion. Um, they're trying to get their, uh, their um, uh, indication for pediatric epilepsy, and uh, that, that could have a huge impact on the, those patients. Um, they had not used uh, Epidiolex in patients over 50, and my patients were an average age of 68. So, so um, that's that, and uh, so I had to find a new, um, new uh, source of a study drug, and so I've um, been looking at the literature and looking at um, possibilities, but the bottom line is, is that I only have funding for um, about 18 more months um, and 20 more months, and so I have to get something, get a, get a source and get it in place, get um, FDA approval. Uh, for it ASAP. And so um, I'm working with NIDA. They now have this 30 to 1, and we think we can get that up and going in the FDA um, in agreement with that. So we're going to start a randomized control trial, I hope, in um, the, the, at least by the spring, um, we're with about 40 patients. Uh, it will be a randomized controlled crossover study. And we will use a much lower dose than we were than the this pediatric epilepsy dose because it looks like we don't need to, and it'd probably be safer. And um, so we're looking forward to getting started on that once I jump through a whole bunch more hoops. <laughs> um, and uh, so the, um, the there's all sorts of other um, ideas that uh, for Parkinson's disease and for neurodegenerative disorders. I'd love to look at. Uh, CBD effect in, um, in whether it slows progression or um, decreases the cognitive problems. Um, so there's a lot of different possible ideas. Uh, I have uh, uh, wanted to mention for sure my study team. Uh, I mentioned uh, my right hand, Ying Lu, and um, then we had nurses, you know, calling the patients every third day, and statisticians that have been extremely helpful and. Um, the University of Colorado, particularly Heike Newman, has been fabulous in supporting this research. Um, our pharmacy, our PharmD colleagues, uh, Jackie um, Bainbridge, Dr. Bainbridge, that spoke earlier today. Um, so I um, really want to thank all of them for getting this work done and uh, continuing to work with me. I can take um, some questions.